Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to another edition of In Theo Radio, where we talk about shamanism and altered states for healing, as well as psychedelics. Today, we've got a very special live episode as usual. Our episodes are live, so you can bear with our technical difficulties. But you can also reap the benefits of a live show by calling in, having your own voice heard on the radio. That call-in number, if you just want to listen or you want to speak up, is 347 855-8334. Once again, to call in, ask a question of our special guest, 347-855-8334. You've got Captain Hugh T. Alchemy here speaking with you live. This episode is called Little Mushroom Saints with Oliver Quintanella. Um, Oliver will be on the show with us today, and you can find out more about Oliver's movie, which we'll be talking about on The Magic Mushrooms, under littlesaintsmovie.com. Oliver is a director, producer, and editor. He was born in Mexico and immigrated to Los Angeles in his early 20s. He worked on the camera department. He worked for the camera department of several film productions while shooting some music videos and commercials. He found Cinema Virte documentary films as one of his favorite styles. Oaxacan Day of the Dead um, was his first completed project, and then with the support of National Geographic's All Roads film, family and friends, associates, and even some strangers, it came to creating this new documentary we call Little Saints. Welcome to the show, Oliver. Are you with us? Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here with you and uh, talk a little bit about uh, this uh, project that we've been working on for several years now. And we finally completed and um, are ready to show it to the people and create some conversations about this important um, subject. You know, I probably mispronounced your last name. Say it for me with your accent. Oh, it's uh, Quintanilla. Quintanilla. I yes. I, I go Spanish, back and forth and I don't forget. Don't, <laughs> yeah, in Spanish you don't pronounce the letter U when it's after a Q. Right. I Quintanilla. Okay. Like La Quinta. We I I know La Quinta is spelled with exactly Q sometimes. same root, same same etymology. So. Tell us a little bit about how you came to are today as a director and uh, cinematographer and what really inspired you growing up and why you would take on, I know it's a three-part question, but why you would take on such a strange cultural documentary set. I mean, you did The Day of the Dead, which is kind of countercultural, and now you're doing Magic Mushrooms. Yes. Uh, well, um, as as I was growing up, I um, went to Catholic school. I went to college. I decided to um, enter to the communications major. And while in college, I got interested in filmmaking. Uh, toward the end of college, I decided to move to Los Angeles to continue and pursue a career in filmmaking. Uh, at the point, I didn't know exactly what I was doing or if I wanted to direct, shoot, whatever. I was just gaining experience and working in several commercials, music videos, etc. And um, then I decided that I wanted to make documentary films. I didn't have a subject, and uh, one day I was invited to go for a hike. On that hike, we ran into a bunch of students, uh, probably like four or five years younger than me and, and my friends. Mm-hmm. And they were planning to take mushrooms that night on that mountain, <laughs> and they invited us to take some mushrooms with them. They gave us some mushrooms. We took them. And that particular experience was what I consider one of um, transcendent, life-changing experiences in, in my life. Um, the main reason is because at the time I was very sure that God didn't exist. There was no God. I consider myself a an atheist, and uh, that particular night, that first night, which I refer to um, as my personal initiation 
into shamanism. Um, I had an experience when I realized that we were all connected. Um, the source of life is not within. Um, it comes from uh, God or a higher spirit. Um, of course, talking about God is complicated because there's many views and the word is um, it, it's a complex word to define depending on your background. Um, but anyway, what I'm referring to is like a higher source of energy that um, helps us be alive and feed our soul with energy so it can, so it can provide for for our body. Um, at that time, I knew that I wanted to make a story about that subject, but I was not really sure exactly what or how or when. So when I came back to my house, I went to Google. This is the year 1999. And uh, okay. I researched the subject. There was not too much information, and most of the information available about the use of mushrooms for healing was in English, very few information in Spanish. I spent some time at um, the Los Angeles Central Library in downtown. I was going there every day to read about the subject and these books that are, you cannot take them home. You have to read them there. So I, that's how I found out about uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. It's my own country. And I found out about Maria Sabina and the mushroom rituals that have been performed for, for many years in Oaxaca, Mexico. Even though I knew about the the existence of this mushroom ceremony, I didn't really pay too much attention because I didn't really know what it was and I had no previous experience with um, psychedelics, any kind of psychedelics. So it is hard to to really understand the importance of um, the benefits that can be obtained uh, with, if, if you don't know about it, if, you don't, if you've never done it. So from there, I had a friend that helped me to go back and forth to Oaxaca many times. He, um, so it was absolutely no cost to me to go there and start doing this research. So for the next five years, I started visiting a shaman, Natalia, in, um, in Oaxaca, Mexico, um, I went there every year, sometimes more than once or twi- two times a year, especially because I didn't, like, there was, it was no cost to me to, to get there. Somebody else was paying for it. So it was pretty easy to continue this particular research. Um, it was the very first time I went there when I met Natalia the next morning after we had a ritual that I was convinced that the information or the possibilities, the benefits that can be obtained from a ritual like this could be of benefit for many people if they if they only knew about it because back then there was not too much information about it. Right. And I asked Natalia that I wanted to make a, a movie about it and bring some people and have an experience with them and film the whole thing. She say no. She turned around and say no immediately because they're very protective of their knowledge and also she was not interested in people knowing right. about the kind of work she does. Shamans in, in Oaxaca are pretty similar like that. They reach a point in which uh, they can't take any more patients because they just booked everyone they, they could for the time. So it's not... It, it, it was hard to like really make that point to her, and it took five years of constant visits and um, becoming friends with her and her family until she finally agreed to let me shoot during a mushroom um, ceremony. So I came back the following year with six people from the United States, and we shot the movie. That's pretty much how how everything happened. What age were you again when you first started all this? You're, you're let's say, 1999. Yes. Uh, the very first time I, mean, I went to Oaxaca uh, was the year 2000, yeah. Okay. So you, you can't be much older than I am. Um, I'm 28. I'm 39. Oh, you're 39? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So 
you you were in you were in college, or you were what about what uh, age? No, about I, I graduated from college. I graduated from college and I came to the United States. And probably four years down the line um, is when this uh, first experience happened, and and then from that everything evolved very slow, very slow because I, I, we didn't shoot until 2006, 2007. Right. That's when we shot. And then later on, 2008, I continue doing some interviews with um, different doctors and specialists, among them uh, uh, Jeremy Narvi and Stanislav Gross. I interviewed them at the uh, World Psychedelic Forum in Basel, Switzerland, in 2008, uh-huh. which that was a very revealing um, event for me. And uh, down here in LA, I interview another Dr. Richard Sander, which... Uh, he he sort of mixes the spirituality beliefs with uh, the traditional Western healing methods. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's also Dr. Charles Grove. He's from the UCLA Harvard Medical Center. At the time, he yeah. was doing a research on um, uh, terminally ill cancer patients, uh, psilocybin research uh, intended to diminish Anxiety, the end of life, mm-hmm. anxiety uh, for, for, for these people knowing that that in their last days or last months of life. Um, I was reading last he, night the. He's been on our show people. once, um, two years oh, ago, I think he was on our show. Yes, Charles. He's very nice. Um, back in 2006, you know, there was still not too much information, and by by the time I've already been. For about six years, going back and forth to to Oaxaca to have these experiences with with the shaman Natalia, and uh, it, it it was uh, you know I felt at some point that I was alone that there was not too many people believing this about this type of uh, healing, uh, but it was then like around 2006. A uh, report came online from John Hopkins University, and the title of that um, article was "Hopkins Scientists Show Hallucinogen in Mushrooms Creates Universal Mystical Experience." And um, back then, I've been already six years through this healing process. And when I saw that article, it was like a moment of like, oh, my God, this is great. Finally, this is going to start to get more attention. And uh, like that, more articles started coming, more research from NYU, from UCLA. And uh, information started spreading, news coming up on the different networks. So it was interesting that the... Uh, in, within the general public, the conversation started again because we have to remember that in the early 70s, um, psilocybin was uh, considered or schedule, made schedule one drug, which made even research illegal. So um, after these 40 years, 40, 50 years lapse of research now is, is starting again, which is great. But at the same time, I think it's important to why not listen to what the indigenous cultures have been telling us for a long time, um, give them voice, and experiment, you know, experiment with, uh, with these sacred plants that can, I mean, after several research have been proven to be effective to heal um, different things from anxiety, addiction, depression. Yeah. Um, let, let me ask you something. The the experiences you had over the course of years, where you were taking mushrooms at least once a year, how many how many times? How many times? Uh, I don't know. It's been uh, it's been it's been since 1999 that I started um, going to, to Mexico. But I go about once a year, you know, sometimes it's been uh, once every two years. Um, it varies, you know, it depends. But I, I think for me, at least uh, at this moment or the, the last few
few years is like once a year is more than enough. It's a cleansing. It's a spiritual cleansing. It's a way to give thanks, a way to connect with uh, my higher self, with the higher spirit. It's a way to get rid of uh, negative energy that might be uh, causing blockages within my energy system. Um, I don't know. It depends. You know, sometimes uh, one important thing to mention here is that um, for the most part, um, users can take them and they do not cause this feeling of addiction or wanting to do it again. Because right. uh, usually the experiences are like, uh, they're, they're hard to process. You know, they bring up right. things from the subconscious so you can deal with it, you know, but it all depends. You know, some people use them recreationally as well, as well and, you know, the benefits won't be the same. You know, for a, for a long time they talk about um, the set and setting, which is a, a, mm -hmm. a term used in psychology, in which it means basically the, the setting or in which... Uh, you're doing the environment, the room, the place where you're at, is it conducive and appropriate for healing, for, um, you know, being in a tranquil place, space, nice, you know, like there's no noise or, you know, distractions. And the right. other part is the individual itself. Are you taking them just because to see colors or... Are you taking them for a specific reason that you want to um, change in your personal life? Do you have a family problem? Do you have depression? Do you have anything that you can imagine can be healed? Because for the most part, I, I, and this is a personal belief, I think all illnesses or most illnesses are self-inflicted. Our own mm -hmm. thought process is very powerful and it attracts whatever whatever we want. And if we're not in control of the thought process, then we're going to attract whatever it is that is. So it, it, it is a long process. I, I discussed this with uh, Natalia, and she said that uh, it is not necessarily a, a one-time fix. You know, it's not it's not a magic pill that you take. And right. And it will, by by miracle, the next morning you'll be cured or healed. But it is certainly a way to at least open up the door, um, get in there, and make a cleanup of your soul and your thoughts and your emotions, so you can start over on a on a blank canvas. So, uh, describe for us, you know, some of the. I mean, you, you've done a good job of, you know, promoting the, the good things, that the effects, the benefits. But maybe there's some some difficulties, some more hard processes that you can share. Because these aren't, I mean, I've I've taken them several times um, with good set and setting and good people and stuff like that, not usually in a party situation. And, and there's stuff that comes up that's sort of like deep, deep down inside that needs to be looked at and needs to be healed and can be a little bit scary. So maybe you could describe some of your processes that were, you know, really intense healing processes rather than just bliss and joy. And maybe did you get it o did you get over any specific ailments that you were going through or how was your personal healing? Well, um at first, um I think I was it was a, a discovery first. The the very first uh, few sessions it was more of a process of discovery and understanding that the, the, what we call life goes beyond the material, uh, goes beyond the body. Life um, is energy that comes into our bodies. We come from the same source and we're all connected. So that was one of the first uh, personal realizations that um, helped me to change my perspective on, on, on life and helped me to change how I relate to others as well. You know? um, at the time, uh, the, that very first time, my life was going like all over the place. I was working a lot. 
I was also going to parties a lot and um, I wanted to change that. I wanted to be like more responsible. I wanted to uh, go to parties a little less, you know. Um, at the time, MDMA or ecstasy was very popular, so I was taking pills constantly uh, for a period of like two or three months. So then I said, I don't want this in my life. This is not conducive to anything substantial. So the very first time when I was with Natalia, I told her, listen, I'm, I have this situation, and this is in the middle of the ceremony. This is after after all the cleansing and all the uh, craziness of processing the, the, the first, uh, you know, reactions. Then we sit, sat down and talk and try to resolve certain certain things. Um, I told her I want to I want I don't want this in my life. I want to get rid of it. How can I do that? And her answer was really really different than what I expected. She the the first question was, um, "Do you have a girlfriend?" And I'm like, "No, I don't have a girlfriend," but like why are you asking me that like what does that have to do with going to Paris and she said well you don't have anyone in your life that is important to you you don't have a wife you don't have a girlfriend so the reason you're you're doing uh, those things is because uh, you have no interest you're just finding a way to kill time to uh, you have nothing of importance in your life, nothing to live for. Um, so you go and do those things, expecting to find something new out of it. And then she said, I'm going to pray for you to find a wife. Um, and then that was it. That, that, was, that was it. There was no more, more conversation about it. So I left, and throughout uh, that first year, I met... Uh, uh, Lynette, which is my wife right now, and then we went the year after, and I said, okay, so I found someone, like you say, and now we are getting married, and you're going to marry us, and she was very surprised, so we had a little ceremony with her, and um, she married us right there in her house in Oaxaca, and and that was it. It, it helped, you know, whatever she did, it is that, I mean, I don't know exactly what she lost or how she lost it. You know, it's all energy, it's all uh, the usage of the hands and uh, channeling energy. That gives me so, chills. I, I have to say, yeah. like, I'm, I'm feeling like my skin do the goosebumps thing. It's like, wow, that prayer was answered. That's this really, like, strong medicine that she prayed and then it came through for you and it's in a good way. For your life. Yes, yeah, so I, I think I think it's always a, a positive positive thing as long as you have an intention. Beforehand, you must uh, say to yourself, express verbally, what is it what you want out of the experience? How can you be better? How can you get rid of whatever it is that that is afflicting you? And it's so powerful. It does work. You know, on the Bible, it says at the beginning, it was the Word, and the Word was God. And what precedes the, the Word, the, what precedes the words are thoughts. So through our thoughts, we can create. We can uh, make anything happen. It's very powerful. It's very, very powerful, but it's very important to believe that that's the case. Because uh, any doubt or any situation that may feel against us can cause the whole thing to not work. But, you know, it, it is interesting for, for us, too, having uh, decided to get married there, because one of the um, specifications about the emotional ceremonies is that you should not have sex relations for uh, at least seven days before and seven days after having a mushroom experience. This is mainly to conserve uh, the sexual energy, which is um, the creative force for everything, everything that gets created, every art piece, every uh, 
everything that gets created comes from initially from sexual energy that gets transmuted into other type types of energy for creation. Mm-hmm. So uh, not using the sexual energy um, for a period of time and then having a mushroom experience can contribute to have a much um, strong, powerful experience um, that will help release whatever is not wanted. Hello. Are you still? Uh, yes. I'm. Yeah. I was just. Yeah. I was, thinking. Yeah, I was just thinking. Um, yeah, I, that that's something that I don't believe a lot of people, a lot of our listeners, really know about. Um, the the we hear sometimes about ayahuasca and how they they forbid that sort of behavioral pattern, if possible, before and after an ayahuasca session. But they don't hear about any of these precautionary restrictions that help cultivate um, the healing process with the mushroom shamanism. So this is great. This is where you can shine and maybe your documentary shed some light um, on like, well, what is it that a person should do so they can heal in tandem with these experiences rather than, oh, yeah, I'm just going to take mushrooms, trip out, and, you know, have sex or, or have had sex, and then I'll take mushrooms and then have sex again or whatever. Does this energy blend well? And what you're saying is Natalia, the shaman, she says it doesn't blend well. And, and I would agree that there's a lot of other shamans out there saying that these don't mix. And what you're saying about the creative life force energy is is absolute truth in all cultures you get your creativity from your sex drive. Correct. Correct. So tell me more about yeah. like what you learned that our our listeners probably don't know. I and mean, maybe it's in the documentary like no sex. Obviously she probably didn't want you to keep taking MDMA. She wanted you to stick to one medicine. Yeah, I mean, the the, the the most important things uh, as far as the ritual goes is to be well rested, to have an intention, um, to avoid having sex uh, before and after for, for at least six or seven days. If you can do 10 days, even better. Mm-hmm. Um, avoid red meat. Um, eat lightly the day you're going to do it. And that's pretty much it, you know. Uh, be open-minded. Be try to be in control of yourself. You know, don't lose awareness of your surroundings. You know, I know sometimes it's difficult. Um, one thing that I remember she said to me: "You are going to have to spend the night here at my house. You can't go back to whatever it is that you're staying. You're going to spend the night here. You're going to leave tomorrow morning. Please try to be quiet. Don't scream." I have family living here. I have neighbors. So that's uh, sort of a way to uh, make you aware that while you are having the psychedelic experience, the hallucinogenic experience, uh, sort of like to realize that you are still at that space. You're still at someone's house. You still have to be respectful and Control yourself as much as possible, as much as you can. But other than that, this is um, a lot of the experience that you're going to have. It just depends on the self, on the person that is taking them. Um, what, another important thing that they always say is that if somebody wants to have a mushroom experience, it has to come from themselves. No one else can tell them, or push them, or invite them to take mushrooms. Uh, it has to be a personal, conscious decision because it's a very different type of experience. It could be scary for some. Um, so it is important that that comes, uh, uh, like if somebody decides to take that route of healing, it, it, is, it has to be their personal decision because that's, that's important too. There, there could be... Uh, the negative effects as well. Um, not everything is like, you know, nice and everything will get solved right away. You know, it, it could be dangerous too. It could, like there is people that have taken mushrooms or other psychedelic drug and and never came back from their from the trip. You know, they they stayed 
over there somewhere, and and it's very delicate. You know, it's not something that you take lightly because you can actually go permanently crazy and end up institutionalized. You know, and that happens especially with people that um, in psychiatry they call borderline. Um, if you're already like right there on the line of uh, I don't know, paranoia or another um, psychiatry, psych, uh, psych- psychological illness, you know, and you take the mushrooms and the environment is not good and the person taking care of you maybe doesn't have enough experience, it can certainly uh, be uh, an awful, permanent, permanently negative experience as well. So never, never, ever take take mushrooms lightly or, or just do them just because because it, it could be harmful as well. I would agree. I mean, in my <clears throat> in my experience, which I, I don't consider to be more experienced than you, but same same process. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in our Western North American culture that encourage people to take mushrooms if if they've never done it or if they aren't sure about it. Um, and that almost always, in, in my observation, leads to that person not really having an intention and because they don't have an intention, they they get lost in the experience and that can be scary. Yes. Yes. That's why it's very important to always live with someone that knows how to take care of of others that are having that kind of experience. It could be a shaman, it could be a, a medical doctor, it could be a, you know, it could be anyone that has that, that gift of uh, looking over other souls that need help. So what would you say the long-term benefits are? I mean, obviously you've got a wife, but not everyone's going to get a wife out of the experience. And short-term benefits <laughs> are maybe you... You have a, a, a personal physical healing, or you have some mm-hmm. sort of emotional healing, uh, but the, the like over the long is, term, the physical part uh, is interesting that you that you bring that up because most of the um, of the um, issues that get dealt with are in are psychological or emotional. However, um, and this is part of uh, the Mazatec beliefs in in Mexico, they believe that any physical illness manifests first in the energy body. So if you can catch that uh, illness when it hasn't manifested physically yet, you can avoid getting sick. That's one thing. But if you're already sick, what they do is something called soul retrieval, where... uh, they believe that the person gets sick because something happened to that person in the past where the soul got the attach from the body and it can find it back itself into the body and that's when illnesses can creep in into the physical body. So one of the goals during a, a, a ceremony that requires uh, or that or where the patient is looking for physical healing Precisely that, um, help bring the soul back into the body so it it can take control of it again and Mm -hmm. start the healing process. And and we go back again to what we were talking earlier. Whatever is in our mind is going to create our our physical aspect. So um, that, I I will say, will require more than one session to achieve physical healing. I, I personally haven't seen anybody healed 100% from a physical illness. Um, but I've seen, I, I know of people that have taken them to like minimize their experience or negative experience with diabetes or asthma. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure it, it does help. Uh, however, we say if we're able to change, like like the other way, for example, if we're sick, we take medicines to heal the body, and then because we heal.
heal physically, our mind feels a little better. But what if we do it the opposite way and we make our mind feel better and that will heal the body? So it's the other way around. And, you know, all these are questions that, I mean, we cannot prove, but we've seen it uh, through, or at least I've seen it through my personal experiences and experiences of others that I've been with. You know, I've been in, in many ceremonies as well in which I'm not participating. I'm just observing a lot of the trips that I took down there to Mexico. It was not to be an active participant. It was to to observe. And I've been in, in ceremonies in which only uh, people from that community were. I've been in ceremonies, like, for example, when we were shooting, the people that came with me, um, I was there translating. Cause that's also an... Uh, and that was a, an important thing while, while making the movie. The, the shaman, Natalia, she speaks Mazatec, and um, I speak Spanish and English. So her granddaughter speaks Mazatec and Spanish. She will translate from Mazatec to Spanish. She will translate, she will tell me in Spanish. Then I will translate to English to, to these people that came with me that are in the movie. And I'm back and forth. You know, then they will talk in English, I will translate to Spanish, and then Spanish will trans get translated to Mazatec. Now, even though these communications are, are necessary during the ritual, the communications is, is mostly for mechanical purposes. Sit here, walk, stand up, breathe, um, you know, things, things like that. Do you want some water? Um, because all the other aspect, the healing aspect, happens uh, happens in, in the non-material world. Sometimes there is not even a need to talk. And the information um, gets um, transmitted from one person to the other without the, the necessity of verbalizing words. Um, there is some experiences that I've heard and, and, and also seen in other people that... Um, uh, telepathy, you know, like there is not really a way to explain how or why it's happening, but I've, I've experienced moments of uh, communication with other people without verbalizing, and afterwards we compare what we were experiencing, and, and yeah, we could hear our thoughts for some reason, uh, and I don't know how to explain how that's possible, but that's what happened. So that's, and situations like that, there's many situations that I've that I've experienced. Uh, another interesting thing that happened once is having some sort of uh, microscopic powers, you know, and being able to see the chlorophyll move within the leaves of the trees or mm -hmm. the other way around, telescoping, like some sort of telescopic view in which by looking at the stars you can tell, on the, with naked eye you can tell which star is closer and which star is further away. From from Earth, and those kinds of things have not real uh, a real explanation. But it, but if we look into it, at the end, it turns out to, to everything be correct, you know. So it's the the things, the experiences that come out of um, uh, of a mushroom experience sometimes are very very unique, you know. And, and there's probably no rational explanation of why or how it happens. Yeah. Hey, so we've got about five minutes left, and I I know we haven't spent too much on the documentary. The like the we've talked a lot about the experiences of making it and the mushrooms and and the visitations down to Oaxaca. Um, could you tell us where we can look forward to watching the documentary and how how to help you spread the word that it's out there? Well, um, I think uh, making a movie itself is, is precisely that, to spread, to spread the word. That's the main goal, to let people know that uh, this type of healing exists. And if they choose and they think it's, it could be of benefit to them, then they, they, they can choose to have that experience. But first, they have to know. Now, there, there is some people that I've experienced also in the past that they, don't, they just don't agree at all which is also fine, you know, not, not everybody is going to agree 100% all the time. So 
it's not for everybody. That's what, that's what I want to say. You know, and, and we're going to have some screenings coming up. Um, one here in San Francisco in September. We're going to be at the 33rd, 33rd Annual Mushroom Festival in Telluride, Colorado. We're oh, going cool. to be at the uh, Mushroom City Fest in Baltimore in October. And uh, there is a few more screenings planned, one for Los Angeles, some others on the East Coast. Boston, New York, and Washington. We still don't have a date, but everything will be available on the website. And then we're planning a final release uh, for Christmas on, on to release the, the movie online and, you know, all the different uh, video outlets out there. Great. So people will be able to purchase it as a Christmas present, and that's a good time of year to, to go yes. inward and focus on, on mushrooms because... Uh, as we may well know, there's some connections between the winter solstice and, and a lot of the Catholic traditions and, and mushrooms. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, Catholicism is part of like probably 95, 98% of, of Mexico. And uh, in the case of uh, Natalia, she's also Catholic. So there's a mix there between Catholicism and the indigenous beliefs. And you see in her prayers that she prays to the Catholic saints but she also plays to her own uh, deities, her, her own gods from the mountains and hills and mm-hmm. all the traditional uh, indigenous beliefs that they have. They mix it up. Something that oh. they, the Catholics are most incapable of doing. But indigenous <laughs> people, they are more uh, polytheist. If they, if they believe that... Uh, St. Peter um, is going to help out, they will pray to St. Peter, you know, but they won't give away their, their own beliefs like like uh, like the church wants them to. <laughs> right. Excellent. And that's beautiful that there's a synergy going on between those those indigenous folks and, and you know, they adopted the new religion and the old religion. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's something that happened, you know, through the Spanish conquest, and and that, that's how it is. You know, it's not much to it, you know. But I I wouldn't recommend anyone to get fixated on that because at the end, uh, a mushroom experience is 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 what it is. Is what what you want to make, you know. That's the importance of the intention. And you know, if if you're not Catholic, you can pray to your God or to the higher spirit or whatever your definition of God may be, you can connect with that. So people can visit your website. It looks like you have littlesaintsmovie.com and there's a there's a direct link on this episode to your Vimeo page where you can look at the trailer. Um, Facebook, if you've been listening or paying attention to our Facebook feed, Oliver and I are friends, and you can find both of us on Facebook as well as you can find the Little Saints Movie fan page, facebook.com slash Little Saints Movie. Remember, the mushrooms are called Little Saints sometimes to these indigenous friends of ours down in Oaxaca. And you can find us on, uh, you can find Oliver's work on Twitter, uh, twitter.com, Little Saints Doc, D O C. Any other uh, salutations you want to leave us with, Oliver? No, no, that, that's fine. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me to speak on your show, and uh, I'm happy to do it any time again. I, I would uh, Again, I'm going to invite you back on the show, and I know you're comfortable speaking Spanish, so maybe the next episode I can get a, a, a more well-spoken uh, Spanish speaker than myself, and I'll, I'll let you do another interview sometime soon. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much. All right, you have a wonderful day, and thank you for doing this great service to the world. You're welcome. Thank you.